Well, good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our broadcast. This is Terry with Jensen coming to you once again. And today we're going to be talking about uh, using meal for posterior coloring. And I hope this is good for you. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, as I said, it's different approaches to posterior coloring with Mio. Some tips, some guidance, observations. Here's a palette you normally see me use all the time. So we always start off with a little InSync Paste Glaze, and the ISPGL is InSync Paste Glaze Liquid. So I'm going to mix it up. We have our trans colors. And the ones we're going to see, if you look at the uh, uh, guide up there, one, two, and three, Clementine, Lotus, and Straw, those are the colors we use normally. I have the colors on the shade tabs, strongest at the top of the tabs and weakest at the bottom. Also, we have value adjusting or simulating translucency colors. The Smoke, which is number seven, the Storm, Cobalt, and Slate, Purple Gray, Blue Gray, Dark Blue Gray, and a True Gray. Uh, great for adjusting value. We also have colors that raise value, not opaque, translumen on the left, lumen plus on the right, and colors that can be used for enamel or hypocalcification. So I did a lot of testing here, and you can see that I have lots of parts of linen and snow, and there is no lumen plua, number three, it's lumen plus. So here's the crown we're going to start with. And there's one as finished. So if we take any restoration, you know, if you've seen any of my other presentations, I start off with a good coat of the InSync Paste Glaze. It's water clear, very dense, no bubbles. And what you want to do is you want to thin it down just enough so that it goes on nice and creamy. You don't want it watery. You want it creamy. Think about expensive nail polish where it goes on a woman's nail and it doesn't puddle or anything. When I apply it to the clusal table, again, I don't want it gritty. I don't want it pasty, but I want it just thinned out enough to where it's no longer a paste. Because if it's thinned out too much, it'll settle in the fissures. The material's made so that it has a surface tension so it doesn't sag or run or drool or settle. So we want to keep those kind of uh, properties that are engineered into it. You should be able to, now I'm doing a lot here on this restoration, but generally if no one's watching and I'm not taping, it takes me about seven or eight seconds to cover a molar. Then I rotate the light, make sure I have a shine all over. There's no dry patches. And that's about all there is to it. Make sure you use something like a number one brush. Think about the size of a brush that's in a nail polish applicator. It applies it very evenly. Make sure if you're holding your shade tab, you hold it in the same plane as your restoration. This is the Mio number two brush. It's what I use to apply most of the basic colors if I have enough to uh, apply. And I want to make sure that I clean my brush in water. I wipe it out of tissue, but then I get it just damp with the in-sync paste glaze liquid because if it's dry it'll grab the colors okay so they may need to be thinned out because when they come out from the jar and they're mixed up i mix any color i'm going to use for that day in the morning and i want them a little pasty not fudgy but but more on the thick side of like cold molasses so that they don't fall out of suspension then i put a little bit on a flat piece and I take a little bit of the glaze liquid and I just pat it in there. That way I can scoop up a little bit. And it's, it's somewhat just barely thicker, like I said, than a, than a thick nail polish. This is a dab and drag technique. So with the paste glaze on there, the color wants to stick to the paste glaze. You see, I'm just floating it across. Think about when you fill an impression with dye stone, although this is much easier, much faster. So the minute the color, and you see my brush doesn't really bend because the minute the color touches the paste glaze, it wants to slide off. And if you push, you'll push through and you'll get inconsistencies 
in the intensity of the chroma, you'll get basically what I would call stripes. So I just glide it all around the cervical. I get on a nice even coat. And again, I don't want it pasty. I want it just barely the liquid side of pasty. So it's, again, like a very thick latex paint or like a thick nail polish, but it has to flow off the brush. We just don't want it watery thin. We want to have it just be um, kind of like a very heavy motor oil or a cold honey, something like that, where it just flows off easily, but not quickly. And this, this is the way we get a gradient blend on the restoration where we can fade the colors out. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Mio number no. one brush. And that's what I have there. And I clean, I always clean my brushes out with water, wipe them on a tissue, and then get a little bit of the glaze liquid in them. So there's the number two Mio brush versus the number one on the left. And you can see when I wipe it on my finger that I have just a little bit of dampness. You see a little bit of stripe come from the liquid. You just want it barely damp. You don't want it soupy damp. And if I hold the brush almost parallel like I had the original number two brush, but maybe about a five or a 10 degree angle, and I can grab the trailing edge of the color and just slightly pull it up, kind of like you're pulling sheets up on a bed. And with a thinner brush, it pulls it very gently. And now you're not trying to push through the paste glaze. You're trying to just touch the surface of the color you added and pull it up. And you'll see you get a very nice fading type of color as it goes towards the occlusal table or towards the incisal if this was an anterior. But since this is on posteriors, we'll talk about posteriors. So now I'm going to lower the value of the occlusal because it's a little bit bright. And we notice this a lot with zirconias. Anything that has any opacity will appear bright. Uh, even your Emacs or your Lisi uh, pressable ingots that tend to be more opacious will tend to be brighter if you don't have uh, a darker color. So again, hold your shade tab up in the same plane as your restoration. We can see the occlusal. The cusps are a little bit on the bright side. So here I'm using the smoke. Now we have the smoke, which is a purple gray or a violet gray, and it does a great uh, job of looking translucent while just lightly uh, reducing the value. We also have the storm, which is a blue gray, and that's great for simulating translucency or if you put it on very, very lightly to lower the value as well. And of course, cobalt makes something look like a... Uh, sheet of ice and the slate is just a true gentle gray material so if i have an occlusal table that's way too bright i go straight to the slate for the for the occlusal table itself so you can see where the smoke's been applied on the distal buckle cusp or distal lingual cusp cusp of carabelli smoke's a very easy color very gentle very easy to learn uh, the storm you have to be a little bit more careful with. The storm gets intense in a wicked hurry. Same thing on the occlusal table. I'll use just a little bit of the smoke. That violet or purple gray is very user friendly. Uh, you really have to abuse it to make it look uh, hideous. And if you have your paste glaze applied. Like I said, you, you won't see this brush really bend. I don't have to bear down. I just let the color uh, come in contact with the glaze and let it slide off. No pressure whatsoever. Just let the color touch the in-sync paste glaze. And again, evaluate the value. So we've knocked the value down probably about 15, 20%. Very easy to do, very user friendly. And I got to tell you, using the InSync paste glaze first makes it easy because one wants to stick to the other. Okay, so if we want more of a three dimensional occlusal table, um, a lot of doctors don't like pit stains. And if you're using something like a mahogany or a dark brown color, 
Yeah, that'll get you in trouble because it starts looking like a road map of a big city. But the Clementine's kind of a tan. Well, Clementine's actually a type of tangerine. It's a little bit more orange and it has kind of a walnut color to it. So normally I don't use it over the whole thing, but I'll use it on parts of it. So any fishers that have an excessive buildup of glaze, you might want to wipe them out with a brush that's damp with the glaze liquid. If you use a dry brush, it'll pull all the glaze out all together. I want a little bit in there because as I apply this clementine, it's going to be uh, just kind of a wispy color, kind of like a, a denton color uh, permeating through the enamel. Now, the clementine's that orange tangerine, kind of light brown color. Like I said, we have the lotus, which is kind of a, a peachy, salmony, fleshy color like that. And then we have the straw, which is a very, very faint, translucent, kind of uh, low value yellow uh, in a pastel sense, uh, not bright, just kind of um, kind of a bony yellow. It, it, it's, it's, uh, we see this a lot. I see it a lot in when I'm doing uh, restorations uh, for people uh, that have come from uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. I see a lot of that color where I see the clementine more on the uh, uh, European type side. So we can see here that we have the clementine there. Now I'm going to use an endo file that I've polished the striations off the last two millimeters. I'm using Fisher that has been mixed up to where it is just the barely the liquid side of a paste because Fisher comes as the only powder in the kit. And you can see the small amount I have on the endo file. And once I get in there, I'm basically scribing it. And that keeps it from being a distinct uh, mahogany brown line. And this is what we call a three-dimensional shading right here, where you have uh, your enamel color, you have the clementine or the lotus or the straw, and then you have uh, an even darker, higher chrome intense shade in the very depths of the pits. Now, if this is too intense, we can always adjust this. So you look at this and you say, yeah, but I don't know. It's a little bit intense. So you can always take that brush. And, and what you want to do is get like your Mio number one or a five zero. That's a zero, 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 zero brush. And have it just barely be damp with the in-sync glaze liquid so it doesn't grab everything and pull it out. And it'll give you... A situation where you get a nice even blend of color while taking out the intensity and again hold it the same plane you can see the colors a lot closer It's interesting, even having the angle of the uh, shade tab or, or even proximity, whether uh, buckles, even with buckle or facial, uh, will we'll throw off the perception. Okay, so this is the second restoration. It's a little bit lighter. And after applying the glaze paste, I'm not going to show all the steps in great detail, but I've applied the glaze paste. But now I'm wiping it off. I'm creating a, a, air, a root section, basically. And what I found is, is if you're going to have Mio coloring, and all the Mio colors with the exception of Fisher and Vendula for the pink kit are self-glazing, uh, as long as you have the Mio colors, they self-glaze. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Clementine, and that's great for root sections. Like I said, I've also seen the Lotus. I've also seen the Straw. It just depends upon what you see. So I'm going to make it just a little bit thicker in intensity. And that's why I never want to thin down too much what I have in my wells. It's as it comes from the jar when it's mixed properly. But I can always adjust this by adding the slightest amount of glaze paste or glaze liquid, the in-sync paste glaze liquid. And now you see my brush doesn't need to bend. It's just sliding off the brush. And it's filling in that gap where I took the paste glaze out. So it's kind of like a little trough there, and it fills right in. 
And this material is not like an ochre. It's a very translucent material, just like we see in real teeth. Um, the roots tend to be a gelatinous, uh, translucent look to them. And like I said, the clementine, the lotus, the straw, uh, mimic this translucency very well. So I just fill in that area. going around the entire circumference of the margin. And this is not the be all end all. If, if you get it too high, you can always move it back with your brush. The trick is to use a clean brush. You've cleaned it in water, you've wiped it dry in a tissue and you just get it damp with the InSync Paste Glaze Liquid. Just damp, not wet, not soupy. And that way you can use the brush to push it down should you want to. Which is what I've done with this brush. It's damp with the InSync Paste Glaze Liquid. And I'm just basically pulling the area down where I have my root section. Okay, I'm using an even smaller endo file here. And again, I've polished the last two minutes two uh, millimeters off. So we look here and we see that uh, I have number six. I have <coughs> linen mixed with snow. Snow is extremely intense, extremely bright white, whiter than anything you see, whiter than photo paper, okay? Whiter than appliances. So if you have a light shade, you want to use more snow. So I'll use like three parts linen to one part snow to make hypocalcification. If I have a uh, darker shade where it'll show up more, then I use about five parts linen to one part snow. Snow's the most opacifying color in the kit because it is a true white and it's whiter than white paint. So you can see the hypocalcification. Now this does bake out a little bit lighter than it shows because it is a mixture. And that's why I don't use, I never use snow by itself. Okay, now I've already applied the clementine here. I'm just showing where I put it. Just like I did previously. And here I put the fissure in. And the fissure is very gently in there. I don't want to put a lot in. And now I'm putting a little bit of the smoke in to lower the value of the cuspal inclines. So you can see the root section, the hypocalcification, the dentin color, the translucency of the smoke. Now this is a much more uh, intense coloration than the previous one we showed. So now I'm going to use, I'm finalizing my smoke. And then I'll go to the incisal blend after I got this uh, smoke on to lower the value and make it look more translucent. I'll use an enamel mix. Now, the enamel mix is translucent like enamel. And it'll highlight the heights of the cusps, uh, the peaks, and just generally slightly raise value while still being translucent. There you go. That's my incisal mix or enamel mix. I call it either, either way, depending upon what's going on. Same mix. Five parts lumen, one part linen, and about a third of a part of snow. Make sure you mix the colors up in the jar before you dispense them so you're getting a true representation of the color because these colors, even after about 18 or 20 hours, will start to lightly diffuse on the top section of the jar where the colors tend to uh, migrate towards the bottom. So I give it about a four to a six second mix every day. Okay, here I'm putting a little fissure on and you don't want that too intense. So after I put it on, I kind of feather it down just to give me kind of a shadow effect right there. You can see it. 
and then I highlight it with the enamel mix. Okay, so there's the two restorations. The first one we did on the right. The second one, the higher value one, less chroma on the left. So one has a little bit more work, but it just it goes to show that whatever you need. Okay, so here's the first restoration after I fired it. All I did was take it off the sagger peg and take the uh, peg putty out of it. Hold it in the hemostat. So not, not touched up at all, straight out of the furnace. And you can see the three-dimensional look that it has to it. I don't know what's going on with our bandwidth today, but when I look at this on my screen, it doesn't look like how I filmed it. So if it's coming across to you, I apologize. If it's coming across a little jerky. And here's the second restoration after uh, it was fired with the application and you can see a little bit of the halo on the cuspal uh cusp tips and inclines you can see the smoke underneath it lowering the value the hypocalcification is very subtle you'll see it in certain areas it's, it's mainly due to the lighting because i can see it but when you're doing video uh gosh my lab looks like it's a baseball stadium you can see the hypocalcification if i get it uh at the right angle and again why would you do that well mainly on anteriors i would i'm just showing how to do it on a posterior okay i had some parting thoughts here and it, if you're using pre-shaded pucks pick the one that actually looks close to your desired shade or it's easily adapted i, I guess some of you will say well the company says this is an a2 and it, it, it looks awful just go through the pucks they have, see what looks good. Mix your colors that you're going to use at least slightly, you know, out of the jar, four to six seconds. If it's in a stain well, two or three seconds each day before you start to use them. Just once a day is fine. And if you absolutely need to have that restoration glazed in one firing, you know, UPS is coming, FedEx is coming, whatever, then one thin coat of spray glaze, our in-sync spray glaze on top of the wet restoration virtually guarantees a beautiful shine with no satin areas, no freaking out. And, and I tell you, it's one of the best amounts of money you'll spend to have something to make damn sure that that restoration is going to look good after one firing. Because sometimes, you know, we just don't have enough material on there. And, and, and we have to be smart about it. So these are little things, uh, tips I, I can give you. Again, uh, just so you know, if you're using a bright shade, like an A1 or a B1 or a C1 or a D2, something like that, and you want to do a hypocalcification, since it's light, you're going to need a little bit more snow. So what I would suggest is like one part snow to about three parts linen for crack lines or, or for a hypocalcification. For the darker shades where it'll show up easier, like a C3, C4, A35, A4, B3, B4, those kind of things where they're high in chroma and low in value, then I would use less snow. Then I'm going to use like one part snow to about five parts lumen or rather linen not lumen uh one part snow five parts linen and if you just need a little bit of a lighter area that uh and you have a darker shade you can even use the lumen one part lumen to one part linen all these things work i've been playing with these if you have any questions please feel free to call jensen our tech support or you can email me tmq at jensendental.com. This has been Terry for Jensen. Please, if you still have questions, call our technical department at 800-528-5531 for further assistance. And make sure to follow Jensen Dental on Facebook, if you would, or Instagram, so you can be updated each time we go live. You can also visit us at jensendental.com forward slash Mio to learn more about Mio. Thanks for watching today, and please click the follow button to get notifications of future Mio education tips and tricks. This has been Terry for Jensen. Thank you so much for your time. Be safe.
be good to each other. Thank you.